thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I think uh, I'll give a very uh, in-depth uh, discussion about uh, um, Charles' contribution in MB area. Um, so today I want to uh, talk something about uh, one of his uh, important contribution. Uh, I remember in 1979, I uh, came as uh, uh, Dr. Cho's uh, postdoc at Bell Labs. And uh, Charles uh, joined the Bell Labs in 1980. So we're about the same time at the Bell Labs. And then in 1987, I moved to uh, University of Illinois. And Charles moved to here in 1988. And we work on the same subject. So I, I think I know uh, Charles' contribution uh, very well. So today I'm going to talk about uh, his contribution of uh, unlock the nature of di dilute nitride semiconductors. As we know that uh, in the 1980s, um, we work on well, if you're in a semiconductor, you know that you're familiar with this chart. Otherwise, and here are the binary of 3,5 compounds. And here are the nitride compounds. But in the, before 1990, uh, most of us working in this area. But even within these areas, um, phosphorus compound is very hard to grow uh, using MBE because the equipment is not available. So when we move to university, the first thing we think about is to use a different way to make phosphorus compound. So we use gas source MBE. And uh, then in the 1990s, there's uh, something big happened. The Japanese, they made the first blue-green laser and LED using the uh, nitride compound. So we're thinking how to make, um, using our current technology, at that time, to make nitride compound. And uh, it turns out we found something called a nit dilute nitride uh, material, which is shown as those red lines. Okay, And uh, so Charles and I both work on this material. So I know something that uh, in detail, and I know his contribution, the important contribution of him. At Illinois, uh, we, because there's no way to crack the nitrogen in, a, in an efficient way in MB at that time, so what we did is we flow the ammonia and the phosphine into the system and crack them, and hopefully they form some kind of molecule that contains both phosphorus and nitrogen. And uh, so in, actually in 1991, it was sent us to APL, and we found this material, which uh, shows a very interesting property. And however, uh, APL takes a long time to publish it. It takes about six months. And uh, what we did, we found is that the band gap decreases with the increasing of nitrogen in the material. And uh, we couldn't find a, a, a way to explain this. And the nearest uh, theory is the, the so-called dielectric theory of electronegativity by Van Vechten. And uh, the theory is not quite follow the experiment. The other thing is when you put more nitrogen in, the material actually looks brighter because gallium, nitro, gallium phosphate actually is indirect band, band gap material. So that's the two puzzles that we cannot explain. And uh, about six months later, well, for the publication, the Japanese, they made the first the gallium arsenide nitride in the, uh, 1992. So they send in the, uh, I think they, their submissions of April 1992, it takes only two, three months to get published. And uh, um, actually, we, when we look at this material, we know immediately this is, can be done. However, by flowing arsine and phosphine into the same injector, it doesn't happen like this because the chemistry, it, it, at the temperature that we use, it doesn't form arsenic phosphor. Okay? So, 
A lot of people starting working on the gallium arsenide nitride uh, with a lot of, uh, I, I think, uh, but people still don't understand why it forms that kind of a band, gauge, band gap shrink, uh, shrinkage. Only in the 1999, a group at Berkeley, they finally form a, some theory called a band anti-crossing, which indicates over here that this is the conduction band of, say, gallium arsenide. And this line is the localized state of nitrogen in the material. The interaction of this localized state and the conduction band of gallium arsenide forms this two bands. And uh, this two bands actually can be described by an equation like this, E plus and E minus. The, the equation is actually a semi-empirical equation because it depends on a coupling coefficient between these two bands and has to be determined experimentally. So with a very limited uh, in, uh, experimental result, they propose this model. It seems to work. It is the work by Charles. And he made a lot of contribution in this area. For example, he studied the uh, indium phosphide nitride and the uh, gallium arsenide nitride and also the gallium arsenide nitride quantiles, as well as the gallium phosphide nitride. Very detailed experimental result. And to confirm that theory, and that we use today. OK, so that's very important. And uh, the most important, I think, uh, when 1991, we saw that result. But we couldn't understand why that is uh, following that kind of a variation. Finally, Charles solved the whole problem by collaborating again with the same group from Berkeley. And uh, they published this important result in year 2000 about the nature of the fundamental band gap of gallium nitride phosphide. The result is really exciting because now they have the theory that matches the result, the experimental result, perfectly. But they also solved the other problem. They found that gallium nitride phosphate alloy is direct band gap material. Okay? So in their conclusion, they said that the incorporation of nitrogen in gallium phosphate to form this gallium nitride phosphate alloy changes the nature of the optical transition across the band gap from indirect to direct. They actually experimentally determine that through pressure uh, experiment measure the luminescence. They can see the band gap variation follows the direct band gap. So that's really solved my problem and uh, make this a very useful material for the LED applications. So with that, I just wish Charles and Linda in your retirement with long life and prosper. And we know that the UCSD has very good retirement benefit. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>